And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 2.30. Up next, Education Today. From the studios of KPFA in Berkeley, this is Education Today. Good afternoon and welcome to Education Today. This afternoon we speak with the new president of the National Teachers Union. As regular listeners will imagine, I was totally turned on when I heard her wholehearted critique of standardized testing, and I was even more excited when she explained to the National Education Association Convention that this type of testing is polluting and slowing down any other kind of progress that could possibly be made in American education. Lily Eskelson Garcia, welcome to Education Today. And thank you for that introduction. Oh, my goodness. Sure. Yes. Yes, I'm reading all your press. I'm so excited. <laughs> you did your homework. Thanks yes. For you. So I'm wondering if you might be feeling a little bit pleased with yourself right now. You were elected about a month ago, and you made these very pointed, critical comments about testing. And and your organization at the same time called for the resignation of Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan. And we did. And, you know, it, it was a very honest, heartfelt expression of complete and utter frustration with the toxic testing that has taken over what it means to teach and what it means to learn. So yesterday he said he was announcing a one-year moratorium on the use of tests for teacher evaluation. So I'm thinking you guys might feel really powerful right now. <laughs> well, I'm hoping he's listening to us, but I also know that it's not just the National Education Association. It's parents. It's advocacy groups. It's people who deal with kids with disabilities or English language learners or civil rights groups saying, wait a minute, this obsession, this obscene obsession of saying, you know, and then at the end of the year, we'll give your kids a standardized test. We'll hit some cut score that some politician went, oh, how about this number? Right. And if <laughs> you hit it, you win. <laughs> and if you don't, you don't get to go to fourth grade. Right. Yeah, and nothing else about that child matters but a cut score on a standardized test it must stop and all so much evidence that holding kids back in the same grade and testing them to death and telling them they're dumb is not good for kids' education and causes them to drop out. So other good reasons for well, not having it happen. That, and thank you for using the word evidence because that is what we're seeing in so many of the political arenas. They've become evidence-free zones, you know, where um, this, where we can stand up and we can say, look, kids aren't career and college ready when you limit what you teach them to what will fit on a multiple choice reading and math test. That is the worst thing you can do is to limit and narrow the curriculum. You're turning this into a game, at least if you're going to report the scores, report them on the sports page where they belong because they have <laughs> nothing to do with education. Yeah, this, this, this seems to me the reason that you may get across to a few more people because you bring a sense of humor to it also, which we need. It is the sports page. Well, you sure. laugh or you cry. Right, <laughs> absolutely. Um, there's a, uh, I'm sure you know this, there's a Gallup uh, Phi Delta Cap and poll that says 54% of respondents, people who live in the U.S., uh, st said standardized tests are not helpful. And yet you're really the first leader of a major organization to push hard on this issue. Yeah. If, and I'm just wondering, why has it taken so long, in your opinion, for anyone to get brave enough to really take this on? Well, I, I can only speak for myself um, because I've been beating this drum for a long time. And I will tell you, in 1989, I was the Utah Teacher of the Year. I am a really, really good teacher. You would want your 12-year-old in my sixth grade. Uh, you would want to be 12 years old if you could be in my sixth grade. I believe it. And so I have, I have, I will never be one of those, well, I'm just a teacher. What do I know? I know everything about teaching sixth grade 
ask me. Um, and I gave my first speech in 1989 to a group of people over the age of 12, the Rotary Club, and I was telling them how I loved parent-teacher conferences, how I had portfolios of children's work and their progress and pictures of the science fair and all of these things that I could show them the evidence of growth um, from their students from the beginning to the end of the year. But we had given the Stanford Achievement Test in the spring, which was something, a standardized test, that the district used as kind of a longitudinal, let's kind of look at global trends in our school district. It's not an individual, um, you know, assessment of this particular child or that particular teacher, of course. And now the of course is gone. Um, and I was telling the Rotary Club time and time again as I was showing parents this big portfolio of their children's work, they picked up this one little piece of paper that was on a computer printout and they went, oh, tell me about this. And it was all they wanted to know. And when I told them, well, see, no, that number, that's that's a little one-shot thing. If it was really, really good or really, really bad, it really doesn't matter. Take a look at all of this. And they only wanted to look at something that was easy yes. to see. Mm -hmm. And I told that Rotary, Rotary Club, what if someday that's all anybody cares about wow. and they don't care about the whole child? We are now living my nightmare. Wow. My that's nightmare right. is now federal law. Yes. Yes. And it's a crusade. It is a cause for me to come back, come back to the whole blessed child. Don't you dare limit what it means to teach and what it means to learn. I take it personally because I know by name the students that I was able to reach because I could look beyond the standardized way that people wanted me to teach. And I said, no, 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 that won't work for this child. I'm doing something different. Mm -hmm. And in the good old days, who would have thought that was the Reagan administration, but the good old <laughs> days where at least politicians didn't try and come into a classroom and tell a teacher how to teach, um, I was able to personalize instruction and give kids a very um, customized way of, all right, you're not going to just answer the questions at the back of the book because you have a reading disability, but you can still show me you understand that science concept. So let's put together this this science experiment and you tell me about it and i could give that child a grade and it was a valid reliable um, source of information for those parents much more than taking a look at a standard standardized achievement uh, test score that was going to tell you nothing great great example I, i'm wondering since you are a very big organization and you know that's a, a lot of the reason for my enthusiasm i think you have three and a half million members and i think you're taking some common positions with the other teachers union the aft too so i think there's a lot of optimism attached to these positions being taken by such significant organizations i'm wondering i know you've only been had your position for a couple of weeks so i don't expect you to know everything you're going to do but i i'm wondering if you're c considering what kind of coalition or, or how, how could people who are parents or teachers or in organizations in civil rights organizations or PTAs or whatever work with the NEA on on this issue are you considering some kind of formalized coalition or do you have ideas about what you think people might do Oh, uh, we've been we've been moving in the direction of coalition building um, now for a long time, and you know I really do have a sense of optimism. I didn't for a while because of the kinds of things you're saying. People were very shy about about really calling it out, mm -hmm. and um, they you know it's well I don't want to be against you know testing kids i mean we're we're teachers we invented tests i gave my kids spelling tests every week you know so how are we it's going to look like we're against tests it's going to look like we don't want to be held accountable for being good professionals you know how do we say this without someone accusing us and i went just say it just say it the testing is obscene it's obsessive it's stupid it tells us nothing and we and that's not to say that we can't assess how students are doing and whether or not um, what we're doing uh, is working for every student what i'm optimistic about is we're not alone now it's not just the national education association 
education. We have colleagues in higher education, colleagues in preschool. We have parents, parent groups like popping up all over the place. It's organic. It's it, You could go to Whole Foods and find these people. It's, it is absolutely in the organic aisle. Um, civil rights organizations that were originally very um, hopeful that no child left untested mm. was going to at least because the one good thing that came out of that is they they did disaggregate the the data so that you could say all right in this school of um, white middle class children when we pull out the English language learners they're not doing very well you could no longer um, like hide children in the averages but what they did was they said so let's pull those children out and give them drill 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 for the standard right. you know? <laughs> like, no. so they haven't actually they succeeded in reducing also- that gap at all and actually it's so closely related to the racial wealth gap that which of course it gives them an excuse not to talk about that um which is probably an even bigger issue and 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 it leads me to another question i wanted to ask you about which is i i personally consider the nea one of the most progressive of the unions in terms of a lot of its policies including wanting to have uh, diverse representation on various nea bodies i'm wondering if you've thought at all about uh, an approach to achieving some similar diversity within the teaching force itself, because there's so many things that uh, keep Latino and African American and Asian people out of teaching. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about diversity uh, over the long haul. Oh, thank you for the question, because um, we believe you have to be deliberately diverse. We believe that the research and the evidence, even in the business world, says that even Fortune 500 companies, as you look at at, uh, corporate America, those that have the most diverse board of directors... The most diverse working uh, teams are the ones that have the highest profits. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know exactly why that works, but I believe that um, there's evidence that shows the more ideas, the more cultures, the more uh, perspectives that you can get um, amongst a, a, a team, um, the more um, choices you're going to have to, to decide um, which is the path forward. So we are concerned that as our student body becomes more and more diverse, our teaching ranks are not joining them. We are still pretty much white, middle-class women. Uh, the fact that I am a Latina uh, and the fact that our vice president and secretary treasurer of the NEA now are two African-American women, we are the first um, women we're the first team of three women and we're the first team of three women of color so we're breaking all those stereotypes now maybe that's a good sign but you if you're going to be deliberately diverse you don't just sit back and go wow we hope someone shows up right you know <laughs> you have exactly to have a plan and we're looking at again um here in California not only the uh, K12 and the preschool um Um, situation, we're looking at higher education as well. Uh, All well and good to say we want our children college and career ready. And if their bank account isn't ready and they can't afford it, then they don't get to go to higher education, Mm -hmm. do they? Mm -hmm. So um, we have another campaign, uh, degrees, not debt, that we want to put um, degrees in the hands of those students in higher ed, not a great big bill that they're going to be paying for for 20 years and, and not be able to ever get out from under that debt. We know that if you are going to look at a group of uh, college students early in their career and say, what about a teaching job? Uh, In the great state of Utah, that's going to be a beginning salary of almost $30,000. So um, if if they're looking and they go, I would love to do that. I would love a job really giving back to kids um, and and they see how important it is, but they're saying, but I'm going to have to take out a student loan. I'm going to have this much money to pay back. I won't be, I'll be I'll be crippling myself financially to go into teaching or social work or, or even nursing. Um, so all of those those wonderful professions that give back to people uh, don't usually pay very well. Um, so what we want to propose on the 
state and the federal level is a loan forgiveness um, um, program. Mm -hmm. Why not go into high schools, especially with um, students of color, students who still live with such disadvantages and often are the uh, kids that live in poverty and cyclical poverty because their parents face such discrimination and low wages and are still just trying to take care of their families living paycheck to paycheck. Why not go into those high schools and say, we are looking for some really talented, bright, creative people who would love to change the world one child at a time. Mm -hmm. And if you will go into education and you will teach in some of the most challenging communities, maybe the community you live in right now, right. so that we home grow this, then you will have um, you know, your student loans forgiven. You'll be given certain scholarships and grants for doing that. We have that ability to do that today. That is not rocket science. Why not a grow your own, the best and brightest minds in those communities, staying in those communities, loving those kids. They're their neighbors. They're their, they're the, their brothers and sisters, literally. Um, why not do that? All we have to do is convince enough politicians. Yes, and that's uh, music to my ears. I didn't know you were on that campaign, but we've been working on that in the Bay Area, especially in Oakland, for a while. So uh, there's some people I'd love to hook you up with. We've actually done a little bit of good work on the Grow Your Own, and that is the way to go because it's an economic issue, too. People need the employment and a stable job like teaching as well as having the kids of their neighbors uh, be in their classrooms. You know, it makes too much sense. How you know? How do we convince a politician to do something that actually makes sense? Now, it looks like you have a few politicians with you, I believe you had a press conference with uh, the uh, state person in charge of education, Torlakson, yesterday, and so yeah. maybe you're you are already building that coalition of politicians who can work on this. I was very very proud to be with Superintendent Torlakson um, yesterday with the CTA president Dean Vogel uh, as we talked to the um, educators in Oakland um, because he's he is just a breath of fresh air. Um, he is a former teacher, so I love it when someone says, I actually know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> it's not something I read in a book. I didn't go to some, you know, um, how to change the world and transform schools, uh, firing your way to the top and making sure that all kids perform to specifications at the end of the assembly line. Um, he understands what it means to teach the whole child. And when I was able to just uh, sit and talk with him before we were uh, on the panel that they had us on, I was so impressed with, he's, you know, he's not one of these flashy, showy uh, guys that is just going to give you the perfect sound bite. He's very thoughtful. And um, and I judge people by, by what they do, not yes. by what they say. And the fact that he was instrumental in passing Prop 30 here and getting those necessary funds back to schools, um, that you understand that, yes, you have to have great ideas and you have to be innovative, but the, there are things that cost money. Turning the lights on costs money. Um, hiring the right people costs money. Um, and so you can't ever say, you know, we if we just had better teachers, the roof wouldn't leak. You know, some <laughs> things actually cost money. Yes. And he gets that. And he says, spend it well. Spend it on things that matter um, and give kids what they need. That's beautiful. We only have time for one more question. I just wanted our listeners to know that I believe the NEA has kind of broken down the idea that there are red and blue states and, uh, and red and blue parties and uh, actually is endorsing a few Republicans now. And uh, I assume that's because they better match the program of the NEA in those particular districts than the Democrats do. But I believe that's accurate, right? You're kind of looking at everybody who matches your program. Well, we always have, actually. And um, the, I mean, I come from the reddest of the red states. I come from the, you know, from planet Utah. Um, and we would, uh, we would look at um, in in some places where, uh, you know, where you had an overwhelming Republican. Uh, uh, um, electorate, uh, we would look for the PTA president who may be a Republican mm. or a, a retired teacher who, who was a Republican. Um, and they saw, um, or business leaders who were Republican, um, and they would see that school as this 
community's greatest investment. They expected a return on their investment. They said our economic development plan is kindergarten and preschool because well-educated citizens who are able to go out there and get good jobs and be contributing members of society and have choices in front of them and can feed their children and buy a new car, that's a great thing. So I think even in, in Utah, when I was president of the Utah Education Association, I sat with a a Republican governor who's long since retired um, about class size and the Republicans for years had said class size doesn't matter it's too expensive you're never going to get it from us and I was able to sit with this uh, this Republican governor Governor Bangader and say what if we started with kindergarten what if we said in kindergarten there won't be any classes over 28 I made up some number um, and then we go to second grade and then we go to third grade you don't have to do it all at one time and he looked at me and he said, you'd be willing to, like, do it one, you know, mm-hmm. in, a, in a reasonable way where mm-hmm. it wouldn't break the bank. And I went, absolutely. And he was surprised that we would work with him. Um, a lot of my folks were surprised that a Republican governor wanted to work with him. We got our first class size reduction money from a Republican. Mm-hmm. It can be done if you can find people who are not ideologues and who really do believe that that public school is the best investment a community can have. It's wonderful talking to you. I so appreciate you being with us. I know on a lot of the issues you've touched on, on uh, debt relief for college and standardized testing and the whole child and so many issues you brought up, uh, you can't hear them out in radio land, but I bet there's some applause going on out there for what you're doing, and I hope you'll visit with us again as your tenure as president of the NEA proceeds. Thank I you. would be honored to. Thank you for doing an important story. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Next, we're going to be talking with a teacher who is fighting with her school community against the impact of gentrification on their school. Erica, welcome to Education Today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, I'm so glad to have you with us. And I wonder if you just tell us briefly a little bit about what's going on at your school. Okay, so I teach at Dewey Academy here in Oakland, California, and it's located on the east side of Lake Merritt. Um, And what's happening is there was, I guess, an unsolicited proposal from from a developer that, from my understanding, sort of prompted some thinking in the district that, hey, uh, a way to to bring in um, money would be to um, to lease out some of this land, and the land includes the uh, old district building that flooded and is no longer in use, an annex building, and then um, Dewey. And that's sort of how they got started. Um, lawyers were involved in committees and all these, all these things kind of, um, happened. There were school board meetings and, um, right now where they are is sort of, in, in my, in my opinion, just a little bit of backtracking trying to, um, engage the community, um, in, uh, developing a project that would include, um, rebuilding the, the, the district office. Um, so an RFQ has been put out um, for uh, companies to propose what they would do with this, you know, piece of land. So as I understand, the city apparently is in the process of uh, creating a development project or has uh, already accepted proposals for a development project which would be something like a 20 story high condo uh, right yes. next to where Dewey High School is. Yes, there's this teeny tiny sliver uh, of public land um, that you know, I don't think that the deal has been finalized but I think there is a company that is sort of you know, bidding for um, the right to to develop on this land. So there would be this, you know, gigantic high rise. Um, 
So the way gentrification usually works is um, you have, so so I don't know the exact cost of these condos, but there's probably basically no one in Oakland who could afford to live in them. So that means <laughs> only people from outside coming in. And that, of course, is always, you know, there's a push for what's called growth, but if it doesn't do anything of benefit to the people who live in the community, what kind of growth is it? It's growing you out of the community and somebody else into it, right? So that, you know, the argument that the growth is good is kind of questionable. And then the other thing that always happens is that if more affluent people move into a community, they don't like any of the things that around them that may be un unusual to them or that they might consider disturbing. So I would imagine that if this is a high-end residential development, a continuation school, no matter how wonderful we think it is, might not be what they're looking for in neighbors. So I guess is that part of the fear uh, about what might happen to Dewey? I think, yes. For, for me, definitely. Um, at one of the committee meetings, um, the the developers in question, I believe Urban Core, um, gave a presentation, and uh, you know I don't remember their words verbatim, but the the gist was you know you know they didn't want our kids next to this new shiny building. Mm, you know? Okay, and so they're saying kids, it. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, right up front. I didn't know that. that. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, no, they were. To, you know, it didn't come out maybe as bluntly as I said it, but that's basically the gist of, of what they were saying. And when you have kids that are predominantly of color, when you have kids, you know, from lower, you know, economic backgrounds that takes on, you know, morally, you know, that that feeling that they're putting out there takes on, a, you know, a whole nother, um, you know, it has bigger implications, Um I think, for, for this community. So I, I want to tell you that I am uh, very impressed by what you all are doing because a lot of people talk here and there and everywhere about gentrification, but the specificity of doing something concrete, like, no, you're not going to get to make our community that much different because we already have a place here, uh, is not always as uh, aggressive as you have put it out there and um, I think our listeners might want to know that there is it's called the hands off Dewey campaign and you have a Facebook page right yes there's a Facebook page and I wanted I want to you know for the sake of transparency I, I think the district you know the school board members you know have said hey we don't want to we're not trying to move, do we? And so I think right now um, there's this huge level of miscommunication and mistrust. I think something happened in the district where, you know, the left hand was elbow deep in the cookie jar and the right hand had, had no idea. And um, I think right now the district is now battling, because of that miscommunication, the district is now battling, you know, a high level of um you know mistrust from from community members and, and teachers and students so I, I i wanted to make this point uh myself about oakland which is that uh, you know there there is this great concern for gentrification people want to protect dewey uh, but as Erica is saying, the school board members do seem to be listening and trying to say, you know, we're not trying to get rid of this good school that's serving students. And it is a difference that Oakland, for all of the things our concerns with it, does have a somewhat more democratic system than, you know, say Chicago or Philadelphia, where the mayor's in charge of everything. They don't have an elected school board. The school board just does what they're told to do. So it's kind of a, a different situation. And hopefully because of that, some of the kind of things that you are advocating for can be possible and be heard by the school district. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, if you want to find out more, you can go to the Hands Off Dewey Facebook and please like our show, Education Today on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Twitter. It's called Education Today KPFA. I'm your host, Kitty Kelly Epstein. Thank you to board operator Erica Bridgman, producer Jaron Epstein, and to our guests. Be safe and be well. Bye-bye. <laughs>